All right, everyone, welcome to our A to J Author New User Trading. Again, this is Jessica Bolak here at the Center for Access to Justice and Technology. And our topic today, um, before we get started, sorry, um, all attendees are on mute. If you have a question, please raise your hand, or you can put your question in the question box. Um, if you do have a microphone, I prefer if you raise your hand. The question box is a little hard to see here on the GoToMeeting. If you don't have a microphone, though, please feel free to put comments or questions in that question box. And if you're calling in today by phone, make sure to enter your audio pin to be heard. The session is being recorded and might be posted on a2jauthor.org. So today's training is on A to J Author functions. The agenda will explain what functions are, then we'll go through um, the seven functions of date, today, age, has answered, ordinal, dollar, sum, and then some quick reminders about functions and then questions and answers if you have any. So getting started, what is a function? A function um, is, built, is a built-in action performed to alter data that is collected. Um, the, the format for a function is the function itself, whatever the word is for the function, parentheses, and then the variable name. So data is collected by the end user in and stored in variables. The function lets you manipulate this, this data. Um, it's important to remember to wrap function uh, variable names within functions in brackets. Um, if you don't wrap a variable name in brackets and it has spaces in it, you'll get an error in A to J author. So with our community standard for variable naming being uh, to put a space between each word, and especially a space between the word and the two-letter uh, in indicator, it's important for you to remember to include brackets um, in your format function, your function format. Where can you use functions? So there's two places to use functions. The first um, is to display something to the end user. So you can display it in the, in the question itself and in the learn more answer section. It cannot be displayed in the learn more question section. We know this is an issue with authors out there. We're thinking about it, we're working on it, but for now it cannot be displayed in the learn more question section. You can also use functions um, to, to manipulate something, the data, in a conditional statement. Um, so you include as the condition telling A to J to do something to a variable or to evaluate it somehow. So two places, in the text and in conditional statements. Um, the first function that we'll talk about today is the date function. So date converts days into month, month, day, day, year, year format. So where would you use it? So if you're making an interview and you want to determine a deadline for an answer 30 days from the notice date, you ask the user in one question, on what day did you receive notice? They enter it in, in our calendar, or click on the calendar and enter it in. The next question, you can evaluate their response and um, look out 30 days from the date they enter and you can display the date for the end user. So the syntax is date, all in caps, parentheses, brackets around the variable you want the date to evaluate, and then here in our example we add 30. So I'm going to go through the um, ones that are around dates and then we'll go into A to J and look at them. So the next one that is date related is the today function. So the today function always returns today's date. You never have to go in and update it. It's always current and it knows what the day is, what today is. So where would you use it? You want to determine perhaps if the user is within a 90-day statute of limitations. So you ask them in the question, when did the incident of discrimination occur? You then can evaluate the variable incident date DA based on what they fill in, subtract to it from today, so it's always going to subtract it from the most current day, which is today, minus the incident date, and you can evaluate whether that number is greater than 90 or if it's less than 90. If it's greater than 90, they don't qualify, you can take them to the exit question um, and get them out of the interview. They do qualify, you can move on to the next uh, set of questions. You can also use the today function in as a limit for the calendar. 
So if events occur um, in the past, you don't want the end user to be able to put in events that haven't happened yet or dates that haven't happened yet, you can set the maximum value for the calendar to show up as today, and they will not be able to enter any date um, in the future. If I'm going too fast or if you have any questions, make sure to just raise your hand and let me know. So the third date function is the age function. And it converts a date into an age in years. Where would you use this? You could use this uh, if a statute asks um, for the date of birth, if the form itself is going to ask for the date of birth. However, only people over 18 can use the form. So instead of asking the end user twice, two different questions, just ask them one question and tell A to J to figure out if they're over 18 or not. So instead of asking them, are you 18, yes, no, and then if they are over 18, later asking them for their date of birth, just up front ask, what is your date of birth? In the advanced tab of the question, um, do the condition, at, and then if it's age, based on what they input, if, you know, if it's less than 18, you can take them to a exit question. If it's more than 18, you can take them into the next question um, on the form. So this just lets you ask one question instead of two for your end users. So that's the last of the date functions. So let's go into A to J author here. And I have a sample um, A to J guided interview created. So the first thing let's look at is the uh, date function. So I have a question. Let's go back one. Notice date. So the question is, on what date did you receive notice? Um, on what date did you receive notice? So let's say I, I received notice, you know, two weeks ago on the 18th. I click continue, and it tells me 30 days out when I need to file a notice. So let's look at how it did that. Here is the variable. I collected in the previous question the notice date DA variable. I wrapped it in the date function and I added 30 days to it. And then it displays 30 days out from what the end user put in as their notice date. Remember with um, macros, if you've never seen them before, variable macros, you need to include percent sign, double percent signs on both to display the actual value within this variable. Um, we did a variable macro training about two months ago, so if you're unfamiliar with that, let me know and I can send it to you, or you can look at um, older ones on a2jauthor.org. But to display it, you have to have the double percent sign. Okay, then for the today function. Here is, um, it's asking when did the incident of discrimination occur. I have limited it so that in the calendar so they can't put in a date. Be, um, in the future. They can only put in today, dates between January 1st, 2000 and today. So we want to see that. Um, when did the incident occur? I pop up the calendar. It's going to show today's date. All the dates in the future are grayed out. I can't, the end user can't select them. So much higher as they might. Dates in the past, they can select. If they try and get around this calendar function and say they want to enter a date in the future, 12, 1, 2012, and hit continue, it errors out, and it tells them they have to enter it. You could change this to say, you have to enter a date in the past, um, you have to enter a date within this date range, anything. This is just, that's just the default um, error message. They can't get around that. Also, in this advanced tab, I'm asking, this is a advanced condition, this is where all the magic happens, and I'm using the today function as well here. So I'm asking after the user presses the button, so they enter in the date of the discrimination, they hit continue button, then this condition pops in. And I say I want A to J author to know what today is, which it does with the today function, subtract what they told A to J author that the incident date was, and if that is greater than 90, I want them to go to question, do not qualify, and exit. If this is not true, they're just going to continue on to the next question. So that's the today function used two ways. The final number, um, final date num uh, function dealing with dates is age. So here it's asking what is your date of birth? 
it looks the same. Again, here I limit it so that they can't enter a date in the future for their birth date. And all the magic, again, happens in the advanced tab. So here I ask, um, after the user presses the button, so they enter their date and hit the continue button, then A to J kicks in and it evaluates the question. If the, um, it has the variable client date of birth DA, which is what they're filling out in the question, wrap it in the age function. If that age is less than 18, I want, again, to send them to the do not qualify question. If the age is greater than 18, they're just going to continue on to the normal um, next question. All right, any questions on the uh, date functions before we move on? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. The next um, function is the has answered function. So has answered is going to return a true false value if a variable has a value. So it's basically you, the author, asking A to J, has the end user answered whatever variable? So where would you use it? Um, in questions, when I ask for name, the standard and the way that I do it is to ask for first, middle, and last. Um, but middle, I don't make mandatory. So they don't have to fill in the middle name. Not everyone has one. So if I wanted to um, combine their first, middle, and last name for a client full name, TE, make a new variable, I can use this has answered to evaluate whether or not there is a middle name. This is good to use instead of those if-else statements in hot docs. Hot docs kind of scares me sometimes, so I like to stay away um, from having to do a lot of advanced programming in hot docs and try to do it all in A to J. So this is a way to combine all of the name information into one variable and condense it before you put it into hot docs. Okay, so let's see how that works in A to J author. So my has answered question, please enter your name, select your gender. First, middle, last, it's standard, gender question standard. Continue button standard. Again, the magic happens in the advanced tab. So after the user presses the button, the continue button, they've entered all their information, I am asking A to J author, has the user answered this variable, client middle name TE. If this is true, that yes, they have put in a middle name, I want A to J author to do something to this new variable. I want it to set a value. So I created a new variable, client full name TE. Um, and if it is true that they have entered a middle name, I want it to show or to contain within this new variable, client first name plus the quotes with a space and middle name plus quotes with a space in between, and last name. If you don't put this quotes with a space, the double quotes with a space, um, all, of your all of your variable values will be smushed together. So instead of it being um, Jane Marie Doe, it'll be like Jane Marie, Do Jane Marie Doe, all the ones. Um, and it won't look proper. So make sure to include those spaces with the quotes. If this is false, so after they press the button, they hit continue, they press the button, they ask A to J if they have a middle name, they've input a middle name. If that is false, then I only want this variable, this client full name TE, to include their first name, the space, and the middle name. I don't want that extra space for middle name if it's blank. I just want first and last name. So let's preview this. Here I have my interview script and my variables running um, up on the side. So you guys, if you've never used them, these are super helpful uh, to see what's going on behind the scenes in A to J. So let's say my name is Jane Doe. I've been playing with this, so that's why there's a female avatar. But female avatar, click continue, and look what happens over here in the interview script. So I entered Jane, first name, didn't enter middle name, entered Doe as a last name, and the um, condition using my has answered function is false, so it's red, I didn't enter a middle name, and I told it to set this new client full name TE to just Jane Doe. So you can see in the variable list, Jane, middle name is blank, Doe, full name, Jane Doe. So let's go back and add a middle name. If I made the middle name Marie, now the condition is green because it's true. I did put a middle name. It adds that middle name variable in, and now my full name is listed as Jane Marie Doe. 
right, the next function we'll deal with is the ordinal function. This is going to return the ordinal form of the number. So if they enter, um, if they have three assets, it's going to return first asset, second asset, third asset, um, 15th asset, 123rd asset. Hopefully you never have an interview that has 123 assets, but it's possible. It's that ordinal form. So you tell A to J to take whatever they put in the number and put it in this ordinal form. So the way to do it, um, where you use this, is in repeat loops. So say you're asking how many assets, the end user enters three, and then each part of the loop will come up. What is your first asset? How much is your first asset worth? They enter it. What is your second asset? How much is your second asset worth? And so on. And the way to do that, the syntax is ordinal, parentheses, asset count. I don't have brackets here because this uh, variable doesn't have spaces. This is the only kind of variable that I use that doesn't have spaces, and that's counting variables for repeat loops, which was a training we've done in the past, so go back and check that if you're unsure on repeat loops. But this way, uh, because it doesn't have a space, I know that this is a repeat loop variable, and repeat loop variables don't go into hot docs, so you don't need the space. All right, let's look at A to J for that. Okay, so the first question I need to go to is the question where I ask, how many assets do you have? So Jane, here I'm using a variable macro to personalize the name. Jane, how many assets do you have? Let's say I have uh, three assets. Hit continue. What is your first asset? Here's the ordinal. So my first asset is a house. How much is your first asset worth? Again, it's using ordinal there. Say my house is worth 300000 Now I've gone through the loop, and it's asking me what is my second asset. My second asset is a car. Second asset, again, the ordinal is worth 10000 Now my third asset, I've again gone through the loop and come back to the first question. My third asset is a boat. And my third asset is worth $25,000. Okay, so as you can see, we have um, the next question, sorry. We're using this variable macro to display the ordinal based on what, what round of the loop the end user has gone through. So the more, more numbers they put into this asset count, it answering the question of how many and they'll keep going through the loop, and A to J will keep saying first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Okay. And then uh, the second to last function that we'll talk about today is the dollar function. The dollar function formats a number with a comma and two numbers after the decimal. So no matter what way the end user puts in, um, a number for a dollar amount, it'll come out in the correct comma, period, you know, the decimal point, two numbers after the decimal point. So where would you use this? A user could enter, say, um, total assets of 112000. That's messy, um, and you want to display it the proper way to the end user. So you could say the total value of your assets is use the function dollar, and have it display correctly with the 112 comma 000 decimal point 00. Just cleans up the A to J interview a little bit. So let's look at that one. Um, in this question, it's kind of combined with the next function of sum, but I asked in those previous questions, what are the value of your assets? And then I created a new um, variable called client total asset value NU, but here I'm displaying it dollar, here's the function itself, dollar parentheses bracket, because there's spaces in this variable, client total asset value NU, close the bracket, close the parentheses. Again, remember I need the double percent signs to open and close the function, otherwise if you take them out, it's just displaying the word over here in the thumbnail the words behind the function and not the value behind that variable. Okay. And then the final function is the sum function. 
sum returns the total value of all values entered for a repeat variable. You want to use it in a guided interview that may ask an end user for the value of their assets like we've been doing. And it collects all of those values within client asset value NU. And then you use the sum function to total up all the numbers stored within that value. So if we go back to our A to J author and we look at the same question in the magic happens in the advanced tab again. The condition before this question is even displayed as opposed to after user presses button like the other ones. So before question is displayed, I want this condition to work to, for A to J to think about if this condition is true or not. The condition I put is 1 equals 1. That's just a standard. It will always be true. So I always want A to J to evaluate this. That's basically how you tell A to J to do it. 1 equals 1, 2 equals 2, whatever. So if this is true, which it will be, I want to set the variable value to this sum, to this value. So the variable I've created is a new variable, client total asset value NU. Then I tell A to J to total it all up, to give me the sum of all of my repeat variable, the repeat variable client asset value NU, all of the information that's stored in there from the three or four times or 10 times or 132 times the end user has gone through and input a value for an asset. It's all stored within one repeat variable. I want A to J to add those all up. Perhaps there is a, um, a limitation on the amount of assets a client can have before they can use your services if you're doing um, you know, intake. Or you can't use a form if you make over X amount of money and you have them add up the money they get from child support, from their work, from um, Social Security, from anything. And then you add it all up and see if they qualify. You can do that all here with the sum function. So let's preview it. Let's go back and see that I added up. Um, I had my house. I had my car. I had my boat. Totaled them all up. They were, the house was 300000 The car was 10000 um, and the boat I had worth 250000 must be a huge yacht. I, that was an extra zero I added in there. Um, so my total value is 560000 in assets. So I can, ask, I can total it all up for the end user and ask them, is this correct? Instead of making them total it all, total it all up and put it in for me. All right, so that was our final function in A to J author here. So... To wrap up, a quick reminder about the syntax. So the function names, dollar, ordinal, sum, date, today, everything, that, need to be applied to variables with parentheses. So the dollar, parentheses, and then brackets again if it has spaces. But for sure you need parentheses on all variables, whether there are spaces or not. The variable names with spaces must be wrapped in brackets. So, for example, if your uh, variable is client total asset value NU, there's spaces all over the place in that one. Wrap it in brackets, then put it in the parentheses of the function. And to show the value of a variable or the value of the function applied to that variable, you must wrap that phrase in a macro. So the macro is the double percent signs on the front and back end of the variable. So you can see my example here, percent sign, percent sign, dollar, Parentheses, brackets, client total asset NU, close bracket, close parentheses, double percent sign. And then the beautiful magic number will display to the end user. If you're interested in learning more about functions, because there are more functions in A to J author than when, what we went over today, this is just the most used ones, be sure to go to the A to J authoring guide. Um, pages 114 and 115 have a function chart and has links to tutorials. So if we pull it up, here it is. Um, let me increase the size a little bit. So it has the name of the function, it has the parameters, the purpose, it has a sample, and it has the result. So this is great if uh, you forget how to do it. This is a quick cheat sheet. So age, dollar, blah, 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 round, round two, sum, today, truncate. Uh, it can do all of that. And it explains how to do it, why you do it, and what the result would look like. So that's one, page 114 um, and 115 in the A to J Authoring Guide. Page 115 has links to take you to little um, 
tutorials on how to do each one. So if you forget how to do the has answer, you can just do the has answer tutorial. Or um, ones we haven't gone over today, feel free to do those tutorials. And then um, a little note about upcoming trainings. We have our last A to J author new user workshop for the year on December 6th. And our last A to J author advanced user forum on December 20th. You can register for all of those at a2jauthor.org. And a quick um, live training announcement. In January, in, on the 14th and 15th, where A to J author, LHI, and Hot Docs are going to be at um, the TIG conference. So before the TIG conference on the 14th and 15th, we are going to do a live A to J author Hot Docs training. So if you are interested, please sign up. It's a two-day beginner training. Super helpful. It's intensive. I'll be there live. Um, Mark Lauritsen, who helps LHI with hot dog stuff, will be there. And we'll actually walk you through in person um, how to use the software, both tools. If you want to sign up, space is limited. So please go to Pro Bono Net and sign up for that. If you're going to be at the TIG, it's only two days before um, in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. So it might be worth it to show up. And do we have any questions, feedback, comments? Um, maybe questions on things you're working on, anything like that, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you or put the question in the question box. Anything? Okay, um, I'm not seeing anything today, so if you guys do have questions, feel free always to email me, jbolak at kentlaw.edu or give me a call if you do have questions or post it to the Doc Assembly listserv. And a big thanks to Callie for letting us use their GoToMeeting services. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the week, great weekend, and thanks for coming. We'll see you next month.